Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the October 19th edition of Crop Talk. And today, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea if we uh, used, uh, used our panel a fair bit and, and looked at the 2022 uh, crop here, uh, maybe just go through uh, some of the things that uh, they've seen or they would uh, I'd like to talk about as uh, kind of important things that happened during the year and things that uh, they may not be the, the most uh, critical thing, but things that they dealt with a fair bit or maybe got a fair bit of questions regarding and uh, so we'll do that and then after that uh, i'll have a bit of an update as to where we're sitting and a few things that uh, have been happening over the the past uh, the past week so to get started our panel uh, so we've got our crop scouting panel and uh, i'm just going to introduce them one more time i don't usually do this so i think it would be a good maybe just to mention their names so Ann Kirk our cereal specialist uh, uh, Dane Fraze our oil seed specialist uh, Dave Kaminsky our disease specialist uh, Dennis Lang our pulse specialist uh, John Gavlosky our uh, entomologist uh, John Hurd our soil fertility uh, Marla Rickman our soil health and Kim Brown Livingston our weeds person so uh, uh, a big group but a group that does a lot of work for the province throughout the year and uh, even today, uh, a couple of the panelists couldn't make it because uh, they're busy putting together Seed Manitoba so we can have some good information ready for uh, this coming year. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to start with uh, John Hurd and Marla uh, Rickman. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, well, I'll let John talk about the, what he thought was something he wanted to uh, uh, bring up today. Uh, thank you, Lionel. And uh, just uh, in regards to your introduction, not to mention uh, the people there, but man, what a good looking group of uh, crop specialists. Anyways, uh, I'll move on to things. Older than others. <laughs> I'll move on to things that weren't quite so good looking this year. And uh, uh, this was, as people remember, last fall this time. Uh, we were getting a lot of soil testing done after the drought and we had very high nitrogen levels. And so a lot of our discussions in the winter were regarding, you know, how much do we need to account for that? Well, what Mother Nature left with the drought, Mother Nature took a lot of that away in the spring with a very wet spring, uh, right from snow melt uh, through the earlier part of the growing season. And uh, we did some soil testing uh, on clay soils or sandy soils just to track was there a lot of reduction and there was leaching that took place we estimate across the fields we did about 30 pounds leached out of clay soils which is unusual they don't leach much but upwards of 80 pounds per acre out of the two foot depth on some of the sandy soils that that's a bit of a uh, a foreboding of what we might see in the crop. And so the picture that is here, uh, Lionel, that I, I provided is sulfur deficiency in corn. And this deficiency was showing up again on sandier soils because sulfate can leach, but this was even sulfur applied prior to seeding. So that early season rainfall just moved it out of the rooting zone, the early rooting zone. This We soil sampled this, the, the sulfur was there, but it was beneath the six inch layer. Th this crop did root into it, but in those sandy soils, we also saw similar nitrogen deficiency, or sorry, sulfur deficiency showing up in canola also. And in those cases, I was a bit more uh, anxious to intervene if, if we didn't have a supply of sulfur there. So, and the way we diagnose that is with, uh, we did some tissue testing, but also soil sampled by depth to show that yes, it was fairly light in the top surface, but ample supplies in the six to 24 inch depth. Um, 
so I think uh, the, those corn generally greened up as plants rooted into. But what I've seen uh, most recently in the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, scouting 20 corn fields late season. And uh, it's a good time if you're in the field, you can kind of assess uh, your nitrogen status of the crop. We always expect the leaves to uh, fire or turn uh, yellow or brown on the bottom, from the bottom up. Uh, and nitrogen deficiency is that yellow V in the middle of the leaf. And that's quite normal. The plant stores nitrogen during grain fill. It moves some to the uh, kernels. So we expect to see that yellowing. But work out of South Dakota shows that if the leaves within three leaves of the ear yellow, that's suggesting we ran shy on nitrogen. And this was very common on those fields I, I scouted on sandy textured soils. Uh, don't know what the yield is going to be there yet, but I'm suspicious that on sandy fields, we lost early season nitrogen and that showed up uh, later in the season here with uh, you know some malnourished plants. Anyways, that, that, oh, I see you've got a picture of a uh, ammonia applicator in the, on the side there, Lionel, that's actually where I'm headed. We've got a, another uh, project going on this fall with the nitrous ammonia with inhibitors. So I'm just on my way to the field now. I do want to encourage people that uh, uh, fall banded nitrogen is the way to go. I've been a little distressed to see that uh, some people uh, switching to a lot of broadcast, which has no one to be a lesser efficiency. So I just ask people to kind of rethink the science on those type of practices. And that's all I'll say for now. Okay, um, John, um, you were mentioning this sulfur deficiency in the corn. So the symptoms you're looking for when you're looking at the, the leaves of the corn, um, or did you actually, like what made you think it was sulfur? I see some striping in these these pictures. Is that what you're yeah. looking for? Yeah, that's, that's what we're looking at but I don't trust myself anymore, Lionel, to diagnose uh, just by looking. Uh, there's a number of nutrients that can cause striping. Zinc deficiency can cause striping, but those stripes tend to be centered right down towards the rural, where sulfur tends to be more full length striping of the leaves. So uh, with age, I've learned that uh, not to call the shot visually, but to confirm it with a, a tissue test, and uh, in most cases when we were doing that, sulfur was the, uh, the culprit, uh, which made sense based on the um, excessive rainfall we were having. Okay. Um, Marla, any comments uh, you'd like to make? Uh, nothing, I guess, um, a lot more to add to that, uh, Lionel, I guess. We're ideal in the area of soil health and soil structure and soil management. Um, some of the things are kind of the same year after year as, you know, watch that soil structure, watch how much tillage you're doing. We, we recognize when we need to be dealing with some of the residue, just looking at, again, some of the photos you have here, um, dealing with that residue, you know, thinking about how much um, we're managing the residue versus managing that soil and, and um, you know, moving residue versus moving soil. So just something to always keep in mind when it comes to a year like this year. I mean, obviously we were so dry last year, we were decreasing a lot of the tillage and then we went into this wet cycle and maybe some people feel like they wish they hadn't done, uh, left some of that, that soil untilled the fall before. But again, things are so unpredictable and we really do need to kind of manage within the, the time and the issues that we have in the moment. Um, but in the long run, decreasing that tillage helps to soak up a little bit more of that water when you do get it because of that building up of soil structure. Of course, nothing can really deal with the massive amounts of water that we had this past year. So definitely not saying that, um, you know, being in a no-till situation would have completely eradicated uh, a lot of the washouts and things that we were dealing with. But Again, these are long-term things, long-term decisions, long-term management, and so always something to keep in mind. Um, and like John just said, when he was talking about you know, um, uh, banding anhydrous, 
with a lot of people going to, you know, broadcasting more of their nitrogen, then that question becomes how are they getting it in the ground? Um, and if they're broadcasting and incorporating, then that can cause, you know, a little bit more of a problem in the long run in terms of, again, requiring more of that tillage. I mean, if you're going to be doing the tillage pass and that broadcasting is happening, okay, it's not an extra pass from a soil management side of things, but again, it's less efficient in terms of the nitrogen side. Um, so just kind of those general things to keep in mind, I mean, as we're going into that fall tillage and fall residue management season. Okay, hey, good. Uh, just a question that has come in. Um, uh, any comments on dealing with uh, uh, tracking this year? And I guess it's more about sprayer tracks and the ruts they're yeah. leaving. Any, yeah. uh, you make a few comments there. Yeah, when you got those tracks, you have to deal with them and that's completely understandable. So when we are going in and doing some tillage uh, to kind of deal with tracks, a little light tillage to kind of fill them in is helpful. Um, uh, if you've got ruts and things that were left behind, because obviously we need to uh, need to kind of deal with that. Um, when it comes to ripping tracks or trying to deal with deeper compaction, I guess it really comes down to how compacted it is under those areas. Um, and if you've got, you know, uh, a deeper rut or something left behind, it was likely wet enough at the time that there wouldn't have been some deep compaction happening. Um, down below because if you've got lots of water filling the pores of that soil then the water is actually kind of protecting the soil it's just that you get a really bad structural mushing around at the surface um, that causes problems so uh, a little bit of tillage to uh, to even out those ruts um, is obviously a necessary evil and we have to recognize that sometimes those things have to happen even if we're trying to decrease tillage that's why I like to talk about things like strategic tillage rather than just going no, you know, conservation tillage or however you want to put it. I think tilling strategically to deal with the issues that you have and thinking ahead to the crop that you're growing and the type of residue you're dealing with right now um, and just managing that tillage based on a strategy as opposed to managing the tillage based on it's what I do every year. So I'm just going to continue doing it. Okay, so you're saying that uh, those low spots were you went through with the sprayer and left a foot deep rut. Uh, you producers I talk to always think they need to go and like rip it up deep because it's uh, it's a deep track. But really, yeah. all they need to do is fill that in. Yeah, really filling it in is the better the better option because I mean, if you've got a foot deep tra uh, track there. In order to actually, if you think about ripping it right to the base of it, you've got to rip down below a foot. Um, and the problem with things like, uh, so if we get into talking about, you know, subsoiling and things like that for um, for managing deeper compaction or deep, deep tillage, the problem with it is that you have to be thinking about tilling when it is dry enough to till so you're not causing more problems deeper down. And if it's not dry to depth of, of your tillage, then um, you're just smearing and causing more compaction at that deeper point. So in those, those low-lying areas, they're probably wet to begin with. And if those low-lying areas also have some level of salinity in them, then doing any deep ripping and, and massive tilling is going to open that soil up. Um, and allow more upward movement than downward movement of water, which means it actually can cause that salinity to come up and be a worse problem for next year. And so, again, if you can just kind of fill them in versus going in and, and ripping deeper, because again, if it's wet down there, ripping deeper just causes more problem in the long run, um, but it looks better because you can't see the track anymore. Okay, good points, you guys. Uh, thanks, uh, Marla and John, for all your input throughout the year and good points today, thanks. Next uh, ones, we're gonna go to John Gavlosky and John, uh, uh, take it away. Okay, thanks Lionel. So uh, in a nutshell, the, the, the biggest insect issues we have this year were flea beetles, grasshoppers and aphids. And I'm gonna focus actually on the third, aphids, uh, now because uh, Lionel asked us to pick one or two things to maybe focus in on that were issues. And I chose aphids because we had aphid issues in a number of different crops this year. 
and I'll start with the cereals. In cereal crops, we had really two species that came in. And when I say came in, um, they would have moved in on the winds from the south. So these are the oat bird cherry aphid. That's the one on the left in your screen. They're a, a smaller, darker aphid, um, a very dark green. And if you look at the back of the abdomen, if you've got really good eyes, you would see a brown saddle or a brown marking on the back of the abdomen. So that's the oat bird cherry aphid, and that's the one that potentially can vector barley yellow dwarf virus. So we had them move in. We also had English grain aphid. And in a normal year, when we, uh, when I say normal, if we had normal seeding dates, these would have been less of an issue. Um, they were an issue later in July and into August. In a lot of years, a lot of our small grains would have been uh, into or past that soft dough stage and really not susceptible anymore. But what happened this year, the aphids arrived, built up, and the cereal grains were so late in getting to that soft dough stage that there were a few weeks where people were doing a fair amount of spraying for aphids and cereals. Now, can we advance to the next slide, Lana? I don't, oh, here we go. So uh, we also had uh, aphid issues in some of our pulse crops. So uh, peas and in soybeans in particular, uh, in peas, it was pea aphid. Now, pea aphid does overwinter here um, to some degree. Usually when we have big outbreaks, it means that some additional ones have blown in. Uh, usually what happens is the population will start building up in crops like alfalfa, clover, some of the more perennial legumes. And then once peas get into that flowering stage, they seem to... Um, be moving in, and especially if you have alfalfa fields nearby being cut, as the peas are getting into their more vulnerable stages, the flowering, very early potting stages. So we, we had um, fairly high movement into the pea fields, a fair amount of spraying this year in peas. And the one thing that um, just to keep in mind with peas, uh, the flowering stage is really the best time to be scouting for them. It's the easiest time to scout. And you can do that either with a sweep net or just by observing or what I like to do is shake some of the plant tips. I have a, um, a, a white container, it's a, uh, a camping wash pan that I take out to the field and I just shake a few tips over that and you can make assessments based on aphids per tip or your sweep net counts. And uh, what you need to be protecting is the young peas the, the the very young developing ones and we again there was some very high populations at that staging this year and a fair amount of insecticide use uh, soybean aphid soybean aphids primarily blow in as far as we know they don't overwinter here or if they do they don't do it well uh, so when we have problems it's because they've blown in in big numbers and we hadn't had a problem since 2017 but this year was an exception. We did have some fairly big numbers blow in. Most of the spring that I'm aware of was more in the east interlake and central regions, less so in the western part of the province, but I know people there were seeing the aphids and soybeans as well. So um, we had them in multiple crops. Uh, next slide, Lionel. Uh, sunflowers. So. Aphids are not usually an issue in sunflowers, and for the most part, we consider them to be usually not economical. This year, they were at levels, though, where they were causing a lot of concern to some growers. They were, there was very heavy edge effects. So when you walked into a field, sometimes the outer part of the field looked like what what's in these pictures here. Uh, you turn over the leaves. The aphids were mainly on the underside of the leaves. Some of the leaves were just coated. So if you were to try to do an estimate on this, um, you're, you're probably looking at a thousand plus aphids on some of these leaves. They were really coated. Um, so very high numbers. There's very little research on aphids and sunflowers, mainly because they're really not 
consider it a pest. We there's a species called sunflower aphid that particularly likes sunflowers, so that was likely one of our dominant species. But then there's a few other species that will feed on sunflowers as well. And I think we had a mixture of uh, different aphids feeding in the sunflowers, probably sunflower aphid being one of the main ones. Uh, but regardless, populations were high. We don't have thresholds. It's something that hasn't really been well researched. Again, uh, not really considered um, an economic issue. Uh, fortunately, when the aphid populations got high in the sunflowers, the sunflowers were um, quite fully grown. They had heads already. There was a lot of leaf material. So for the most part, I really don't think the populations that were there were economical, although it looks bad. I knew of a, uh, a couple of fields where the people did edge sprays for them, but whether it was economical or not, it's really hard to say. And the other thing I'll note, um, at least in the Carmen area here, when I this is these um, photos are from a field just south of Carmen. Uh, the the leaves that had the the aphids were just loaded with natural enemies, uh, and in this field in particular, lady beetles were just all over the leaves, so they were helping to uh, knock things down a bit. They had lots of food by this point in the season. So next slide. Okay, so I, I said I would focus on aphids, but I do have a couple other things I'm going to um, uh, talk about. I had uh, several people send me photos or specimens with these slug-like things they were finding on their crops, and most of these were coming from either cereal grains, um, peas, soybeans, crops that had aphids. Um, and hopefully people uh, know what these are. Uh, you, can, you can hit uh, advance Lionel on the answer what these are will pop up. Um, these are hoverfly larvae. So hoverfly larvae are somewhat legless. They've got little um, pads more than they do legs, so they really can't move far. And the eggs are usually laid right in the aphid colonies. Uh, they're in there feeding on the aphids. We had so many aphids. Um, that, uh, that there was a lot of food for some of these natural enemies. And hoverfly populations were uh, incredibly large in some areas. I know in the Carmen area here, uh, the sticky traps I was putting up for other bugs were sometimes just coated in hoverflies, which was kind of sad to see. But there was a lot of larvae in some of the fields. People were wondering, are these an army worm or something? Should we be worried about them? Short answer, no. They're hoverfly larvae. They're predators. They eat aphids. So. Uh, some good guys helping out as well. So we'll go to the next slide. And I'm going to finish up by, just to get you in the mood for Halloween, by talking about mummies in your crops. So a lot of people in a lot of the crops with aphids, uh, uh, peas, cereals, were finding these kind of inflated, bronzy um, aphid corpses. And what's happened here is they've been parasitized. So you can hit enter, Lionel, and I think an answer to what these are will pop up. Uh, these are aphid mummies. They're basically the parasitized uh, homes for the, uh, the, the parasitoid larva. Uh, eggs are laid right into the, the aphids, and you've got uh, the, the wasp larva developing in the now dead aphid. Uh, the, the, the cuticle hardens to, to make a nice home for that parasitoid. And on the uh, left, you can see holes in some of these uh, aphid mummies. That's where parasitoids have popped out of their little aphid home. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is what the parasitoid looks like, uh, the picture on the right. They're tiny little black wasps. The one that we had this year uh, would have been aphidious, and the reason I can tell that is by the color of the aphid mummies. Uh, there's basically two major groups of aphid mummies. There's one group that is more black, and then another group that's more pale or bronzy like we had this year. So it's aphidious that was doing the work for us this year. Aphidious ervi tends to be one of our dominant species. And uh, this picture here is showing how they parasitize the aphid. They will come and tap the aphid with their antenna, 
And once they've detected that it is an aphid, they whip their abdomen around super quickly, lay an egg in that aphid, and that just takes a fraction of a second. And if we can get it to work, the next slide, I do have a video showing this in action. So, Lionel, if you can take that away, we'll... The green peach aphids had taken over the crop, but their reign was ending. Enter Aphidius Irvine, a parasitoid capable of ravaging their populations. So every time it's tapping an aphid, it's, it was injecting it with uh, an egg. It happens very quickly. It was probably hard to see uh, that happening. Um, Crop defenders to fight another day. There we go. That's part. Well, that's one of our field heroes uh, videos that we produced, uh, trying to show some of our natural enemies in action. So uh, we, we did have a lot of aphids this year. In some fields, we had help from the natural enemies. In other fields, the help was coming a bit too late, so there was quite a bit of spraying. So that was one of our uh, our top insect concerns from this year. Okay, John, uh, one question regarding the sunflowers. Was that, would an insecticide actually help if the uh, aphids are underneath the, the leaf? Uh, well, that's the other tricky part, is just getting the coverage. And in sunflowers, they are mainly kicked under the leaves. So, again, whether the, the sprays that people did were economical or not, really hard to know. And, yeah, good point, hard to know did they even get good coverage and good control? And I really didn't hear a follow-up from those fields uh, to know what kind of control they actually achieved. Okay, well, great, John, and thanks again for uh, supplying us with uh, good information throughout the year. It was uh, uh, good to have you on the panel. Okay, thanks. Uh, mentioned at the beginning that um, Ann Kirk is working on Seed Manitoba, so she wasn't able to join us today, but uh, I got a hold of Errol Bergen that works fairly closely with Ann. Uh, he's uh, one of our cereal guys and our uh, crop production extension specialists, and I asked Errol if he could come on and maybe make a couple comments regarding our cereal crops and how they did and maybe some of the issues we might have ran into. So, uh, Earl, take it away. Thanks, Lionel. Um, yeah, I guess the big story is you'll probably hear with all the other uh, uh, crops, uh, you know, categories, pulses, and oil seeds is it was, was just the late seeding or the varied seeding as well as just all the moisture. I mean, that's no surprise province wide. We kind of saw a lot of it. So, um, you know, whether your wheat got seeded early or you got caught in the rain, you know, that would potentially develop for some issues, you know, drowned out areas, excess stress, weed issues, weed timing issues as far as when uh, when you could get sprayed or, you know, if you could get your burn offs done, all these things um, um, played into uh, into this year's production of the cereal crop. Um, kind of some issues, I guess, one we deal with every year and no surprise, uh, fusarium head blight. Uh, this year, I know some of those uh, risk maps that that the province generates. It was read uh, quite a bit throughout, uh, you know, that uh, critical flowering period. There's high high humidity with with all the moisture that we were having, and that you know that high humidity within the microclimate of the of that crops, and you know the the old disease triangle we always talk about, where it's you know the the pest, the you know the pathogen is there, the conditions are right, and um, and the host is there, so um, there was a high potential. Um, and reports will vary. You know, people do spray, and and a lot of people are producers. I mean, putting their fusarium protectant on uh, at the right timing. It, you know, a lot of people have figured that out, and they get the best bang for their buck. Um, but we, you know, we would expect to see increased fusarium levels. Um, in some of the samples and some of that data uh, isn't out yet you know from the grain commission who kind of do a report on that every year I don't think that has come out yet but uh, there you know I'll just leave it at that there, there could be higher levels because we just had the the, uh, the right conditions for that um, um, just some stuff um, you know it comes with with a, a wet year um, later maturing we had a lot of you know, a lot of years in, in August, we're already, you know, obviously you were combining wheat and 
and other cereals, barley, um, and not that that didn't happen, but it did stretch out. And you know, I've just heard reports uh, in the area. Uh, I work in the eastern part of the province, and I was actually talking to a friend who isn't a farmer, but he he was even noticing. He's like, hey, there's still oats fields out. That's really weird because we're like whatever middle of October, right? And it's just the year we had people are in the fields harvesting what they can get to. Maybe there's some lower lying areas that are just not, you know, that particular field. Um, they just put the brakes on and went to something else. And, you know, maybe they're doing soybeans now. And that, that's just really odd to be doing soybeans before your oats. But that's just the, the year we had. So I'll just touch on a couple of yields. Um, just averages now when you talk about province-wide it's really hard to give an accurate picture uh, but for fall rye we were kind of in that 75 to 90 bushels an acre uh, so obviously like in all the yields I'm going to report or say there's going to be lower there's going to be higher but this is kind of the average we were hearing and like I said again for the province so that's going to vary a lot. Uh, we did get reports in the fall rye for of some higher levels of ergot so that was something to to watch out for. Uh, for winter wheat, generally it was in that 60 to 70 bushels per acre. Um, I should say too, with, with the cereals, there wasn't really, you know, I didn't hear anyone really um, upset with the yields they were getting. They were average to above average. Some people got, you know, did really well. So like on average, these are kind of where we would expect to, to you know, to fall under within the province for, for, for these crop types. Um, Again, with the with the winter wheat, uh, as to the spring wheat, and I'll mention it as well. There's just a higher risk of FHB in the sample due to those wetter, humid conditions that we we saw throughout the growing season. Um, yeah, so for spring wheat, uh, generally the the averages or the it's a bit wider. We were look we're seeing you know anywhere from 60 to 90 bushels an acre. That can again depend on whether or not you're um, <clears throat> you know what varieties you're growing what what class of wheat, um, but uh, generally, again, yields were good, um, average to above average. Um, proteins, reports we were getting, uh, you know, in that 13.5 to 14.8 uh, percent protein. So that's kind of where we would expect it to be, again, to, depending on the class of wheat you're growing. Um, for FHB, uh, like I, I mentioned, the the Grain Commission report is, isn't out yet, but it, um, just again, due to those um, those wetter, humid conditions, we're gonna we're expecting to see slightly higher levels, and you know, hopefully, um, people were able to get their protectant project uh, products on um, at the correct timing. Again, there was you know some issues getting that on just with with the weather and the you know field access, even getting your sprayer in if you just had a rain, and it's. Uh, all kinds of, of different scenarios like that. Uh, for test weight, uh, on on average, the spring wheat was good between uh, 61 to 66 bushels an acre is what we were reporting in the crop report. Um, I'll move to oats. Generally there, um, we were about 120 to 130 bushels per acre. Test weights were in that one, uh, sorry, uh, 44 to 48 pounds per bushel. Um, so, um, you know, a kind of in an average yield, maybe slightly slightly below average, depending on where you farm and how aggressively you fer fertilize things like that. Um, and as I mentioned, they're they're you know with with uh, swaths or uh, or field standing for longer periods of time into the fall into October, you can get some of those uh, um, degrading or uh, staining of, of the oats, and you're you know. That, that's going to affect your quality and your your sale saleability or or what grade you get. Um, same would be said for barley. Uh, most of the barley that that I've heard of, um, you know, in my part of the world here, we we don't grow a ton. Um, but um, again, uh, the the yield range was kind of average. You know, at 65 to 90 bushels an acre. Uh, more common would be about 65 to, or sorry, 60 to 70 bushels an acre. And again, there, there's potential with with barley for you know the longer it it if it is swath, the longer it sits in the swath, the more rain it gets, the more staining you get. And if you're going for malt, uh, th those kind of <clears throat> crops or or those varieties that are slated for malt and guys, you know, 
it's, it's just going to be harder to get that quality you're, you're going to need. So like, I guess just to, to sum it all up, it was a weird year. It was a very, quite variable year, uh, lots of challenges, but I think overall people uh, were able to, to pull it off and, and some good yields were, were, were seen and, um, and you know, av average to, to good quality. Um, and so I think overall producers were happy with, with the cereal crop. I'll just touch on corn a little bit. Uh, I think the silage is wrapping up in my area. It is, I did see some cutting on the weekend uh, or some chopping um, guys trying to get what they could before it got too dry. But with the heavy frosts we've got, things are obviously dying. The, you know, those, those shanks on the cob are, are down in the field I was in this week, all the cobs are down and, um, or even last week. So obviously, we're done um, and now it's just waiting to dry down. There has been some grain taken and I'm expecting with the warmer days or the <laughs> warmer in, in quotation marks, um, you know, plus 10 degrees, there'll be some guys trying to get what they can um, this week, but very little has been done. I do not have any yield estimates, but from what I've heard, you know, from some corn tours I've been on and stuff, it's just, you know, most of the corn made it. There'd be some later seeded stuff that that wouldn't, would would likely have you know maybe it'll lose some test weight just because it wasn't at physiological maturity before the frost hit, uh, depending where you were again in the varieties you grew. Uh, but um, yeah, I think most people are expecting a decent to you know average to above average corn crop. Uh, looks like they're gonna you know they're gonna make make some decent yields. So we'll wait to see what those yield numbers as they come in uh, in the next week or two. So with that, I'll just hand it back to you, Lionel. Okay, uh, sure. And um, before we leave cereals, um, I was wondering if uh, David Kaminsky, our pathologist, would want to maybe make a comment on if he had noticed any any disease that showed up. I know Earl mentioned a bit about fusarium, but was there anything else that kind of showed up that you might want to mention? Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, well, Earl mentioned ergot from the start, and that was something that was observed occasionally. That's indicative of a wetter year. Um, we have some preliminary results from our Fusarium Headlight Survey, and in that we found 65% uh, of the fields had some level of Fusarium, and uh, in those, the average incidence was only five, which is five out of the um let's see 100 plants no we collect 50 plants in a in a wheat field so that's an average of two and a half plants out of those 50 that showed some level of disease and it was generally at a fairly low level um, there was only one field for instance that had a fusarium headlight in index of 3.6 and that would likely end up um having some FDK in the harvested grain, many of the other samples would be um, the kind of kernels that are blown out the back of the combine, so they wouldn't register on that uh, FDK rating. Now, um, I guess I would say I am uh, surprised a little that we didn't see more fusarium head blight, given that uh, the risk seemed to be high to extreme for much of the year. But I, every field I went through had uh, wheel tracks and uh, indicated that it was sprayed with a fungicide and probably trying to get at the timing of uh, hit light control. So perhaps many of those uh, fields would have been higher. Uh, I do have one unsprayed field among mine that uh, had a fusarium hit light of index of 2.5. And again, that's something that probably would show up in a harvested sample. Um, in cereals, uh, one other thing that uh, seemed to be more prevalent this year than other years was oat crown rust. And um, my colleague with Ag Canada in Morden, Jim Menzies, tells me that um, later in the season, the conditions were ideal for uh, the buildup of rust within the crop, that is recycling of the orange or urea spore stage of the rust. 
Um, I still think that uh, our local alternate host is a big reason that we see um, Oak Crown Rust just about every year. And uh, Jim says that some did blow in from the south, although we had very few uh, southerly winds this year. Uh, moving on to canola, um, we've just wrapped up the analysis of our canola disease survey. And uh, this year we looked at 116 fields. One thing of note, uh, no surprise because of the wetter year, is that sclerotinia was up substantially, although it had been pretty well flat and insignificant for the last three or four drought years. Uh, it was found in 36% of the fields, and seven of those had an incidence of higher than 10%. And at 10%, you could probably expect a about 5% yield loss. So with the price of canola this year, that would uh, be significant in the pocketbook. Black leg, um, same uh, prevalence throughout the province, found in 87% of the fields. In half of the fields, the um, incidence was greater than 10%. And again, that would likely result in some significant yield loss. Brucillium stripe is the one we're keeping an eye on and uh, Lionel has thrown up uh, a slide showing Verticillium stripe symptoms. Um, about the same percent prevalence as last year. We're again at 40%. It's been the same for three years in a row. And um, let's see, about uh, half of those that uh, showed any symptoms were greater than 10% incidence in the field, actually some as high as almost 90% incidence. And that certainly has to have an impact on yield, although that's still being worked out, the exact relationship between the incidence of the disease in the field, severity, and potential yield loss. We do know that it's a disease that uh, becomes apparent visibly late in the season, but my colleague Vikram Bisht, who works with vegetable crops, says that um, from the microsclerotia in the soil, um, these crops can get infected fairly early, and uh, then it's acting like a, a vascular wilt. And so that could potentially have an impact on yield. Um, two things that I had come to me anecdotally are um, downy mildew in peas. That seems to be only in a couple of fields. And uh, the likely source in that case is a seed borne inoculum. Another was uh, rust in field peas. And uh, not sure the, the details of that. Uh, one of the agronomists with Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers came across that. A bacterial stripe in wheat. We uh, saw a lot of that about two years ago, in particular one variety, AC view field. Um, this year, we only heard anecdotally of a couple of cases in the Eastern region. And those were again that, um, variety that seems to be more susceptible than others. Um, Dennis is on the call. Um, I asked him if he participated in the uh, field P study and uh, has some preliminary results, but uh, in the chat he said back to me that they're still processing data. Of course, phantomyces is the disease that uh, most are concerned about because of the big impact it's had in Saskatchewan, where they've been growing field peas with some intensity longer than we have. We did grow more peas back in the day, and some say that a phanomyces, a root rot, is the disease that drove production out of Manitoba. It thrives in wetter conditions. It has thick-walled resting spores, so can persist in the soil for a long time. Speaking of those diseases that uh, are persistent in the soil, um, club root is another we're always keeping an eye on. In those 116 fields in the canola disease survey, we saw none. One new symptomatic case 
was identified in the RM of Lorne, and uh, that puts that RM over the threshold of 10 fields shown, documented with uh, symptomatic infection. And uh, that means a color change uh, in the map that uses the same criteria as the Saskatchewan map. Mm, I hope I haven't missed anything. And I'm sorry I don't have any wonderful slides to show you, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Um, what I'll do before I ask you the question that came in is I'll maybe get Dane uh, Frace to comment on uh, canola. And uh, Dane has been, uh, he's our, our oil seed specialist, and maybe he could comment on canola and flax as well. Okay, Dane, we're not hearing you if you're talking. I see you've unmuted yourself, but we're not, I'm not catching your audio. Nope, still nothing. Okay, well, uh, while he's trying to come back in, David, the question has uh, come in and where did I put it here? Well, I'm going to get that question, Dane, and then I, David, and I'll get back to you. Okay, uh, we're going to okay. go to uh, Dennis Lang, and he's going to update us on the uh, pulses and uh, and see what the, how the year went that way. Alrighty, so uh, thanks for having me on here this morning. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I have a couple of slides to show today. So if I can uh, have the screen, please. There we go. And we're just going to put this full size. And just give it a second. Here we go. All righty. Well, I'm going to start off with a bit of a comical slide here. Um, this is something I've never come across before. Uh, we went to a soybean field. And this is my summer student, uh, Ashlyn, from last year, as you can see, wearing her booties. Um, I've never seen a sidewalk right beside a soybean field before. So that was rather unique. So um, just, uh, just a, a point to start off with. Um, so next, we're going to just get into my next slide here and there we go okay one of the big things that changed for this year in manitoba and this is a permanent change uh, moving forward is the change of the soybean seeding deadlines um, from manitoba agricultural services corporation um, this decision was made this year uh, based on data that was that uh, both masc had and data that kristen mcmillan um, has done uh, research that she's done as well so um, the color coding here, you'll see uh, in the bottom uh, corner, bo bottom middle here, uh, risk area one for soybeans. Um, full coverage is now June 8th. Uh, extended is from June 9th to June 13th. Um, the red area, um, risk area two, uh, that moves uh, to June 4th um, as full coverage and extended is June 5th to 9th. Uh, soybean area three, which is kind of the, uh, the grayish black area around through here. Um, that area right now is uh, full coverage is June 4th and extended June 5th to 9th. And uh, the area that did not change this year is soybean area four. Um, that's the uh, the full coverage is May 30th and there is no extension. So um, this is what was able to be done this year. The, uh, the change in risk area one, two, and three. Uh, moving forward in risk area four, um, there, there needs to be further discussion on how that's going to happen, if it's going to happen. Uh, but I think there needs to be more discussion with uh, with crop insurance on that to really look at the areas and look at the data to see where uh, things can be changed. Um, this information is based on data um, that uh, has been collected with more, the more recent varieties. Um, originally, when this uh, these zones were established, they were established with varieties that were a little longer season than what we're currently growing here now. Um, and uh, now, with uh, varieties maturing earlier, growers have a lot more options. So I think this was. This was a benefit to, to a few producer, producers this year, just because of the late spring, it gave them a few extra days to get the crop in, and then I think that's all they needed. Um, but that's kind of what I'm gonna start off with for a slide here. So I'm um, gonna talk about a few things. I'm not gonna talk about the soybean aphids data. John did a wonderful job doing that, uh, and the pea aphids as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, I did do this year, and I do every year, but something that uh, uh, we do for the uh, Provincial Seed Guide Seed Manitoba, is we do IDC ratings. And uh, uh, the picture on the left here, uh, that's our plots, they're single row plots. And you, as you look through here, 
I'm just going to show my pointer here. And uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, plots like this, uh, where I'm highlighting here, that's a very susceptible variety. Um, this particular site is located close to Winnipeg um, on the Keith Murphy farm. Uh, we plant these single row plots, we replicate it three times, and then I go back once a week for three weeks. So we get a total of nine ratings, and those ratings are all listed in Seed Manitoba, the, the summary. Um, what we find is that uh, with these varieties on the picture on the right here, uh, this variety here is more of a semi-tolerant variety. Um, you know, it's it's got some yellowing to it here. There's a little bit of chlorosis in here, but generally the plants look fairly healthy compared to the highly susceptible variety right beside it where you see that stunting and the chronic tissue. Um, this is probably one of the first years that I've, you know, the first time going out, we saw quite severe symptoms. Um, in the field this year too, I had a lot of calls from growers as well. And um, um, in the end, things do tend to grow out of it, especially if you're growing a semi-tolerant variety. Um, uh, but one thing to kind of keep in mind moving forward is when you're doing your soil test this year, um, one of the things you should do is make sure that they do a carbonates and sol soluble salts uh, test as well. If your carbonates are greater than 5% five, 5 and your salts are greater than one or approaching one, you want to pick a variety that is tolerant. Um, you can use that list to help pick your varieties, but you really need to use that uh, uh, tool to help you out. Doesn't mean that the varieties that are semi-tolerant or susceptible are, are poor yielding varieties. What it does mean though, is on fields with high carbonates and high salts, you really want to make that selection. Uh, it, it's a lot more important because uh, IDC does not show up every, every year, but uh, interesting to note in uh, some of our portage soybean plots this year, it's the first time I've seen actually plots go down and, and basically lose plots because of IDC with extremely susceptible varieties. We did do a, a, a salt and carbonate test on it afterwards, and this was probably the perfect storm for that uh, IDC to show up this year. Um, this and uh, so we might lose some of our plots uh, in the portage uh, for portage data this year just because of how severe it was. Um, this is from the soybean fertility fact sheet that uh, has been put together uh, and you can find it on the Mental Pulse and Soybean Grower website. Um, this is that table I, or the ratings I was telling you about before. Carbonates, if you're greater than 5% and greater than one micromole per centimeter, you're in that extreme range for risk for IDC. So in those situations, you want to pick definitely a tolerant variety. Whereas if you're in areas where your salts and carbonates are low, um, then you might be able to go with a variety that is more susceptible uh, if it's something if it's a variety that you prefer based on maturity or or yield. So that's something to keep in mind uh, and something we can take forward into next year. Um, one of the things that we saw this year late in the season is we saw a bit of phytophthora root rot. Um, we did not see a whole lot in our disease survey that we did at the towards the end of end of uh, end of August or mid August. Um, I guess mid, mid to early August is when we would have done that survey, but we did start to see some or have some reports of phytophthora root rot showing up in mid to late August. Now, those that phytophthora wilt that you kind of see here, um, a telltale sign here is when you look at um, you know the stem itself, you see that browning of the stem it browns from the ground level up. Um, you can see here the transition zone. The leaves typically hang on the main plant. Um, it it differs from northern stem canker as as if those roots are brown, that would be more phytophthora, whereas if those roots are white, that might be more northern stem canker. Um, the reason I bring this up, uh, we've had a few no or a number of dry years, so we haven't had a lot of phytophthora. And even, even this year, we haven't seen a lot in the fields, but growers have found some, uh, even when I'm, I'm harvesting the soybeans here, and I can see areas now that uh, were highly affected by phy phytophthora root rot, just, just little patches. <coughs> and uh, one of the things that uh, you can help, uh, you know, combat this particular disease besides rotation is in the provincial seed guide in Seed Manitoba under the variety description table, you'll find the ratings for the, uh, or not the ratings, but you'll find the major gene resistance listed. Now, major genes are only half the, half the scenario. The other thing we need to talk about is field tolerance. Now, various companies have ratings for field tolerance for their own varieties. Uh, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers, uh, along with uh, the inter some of the industry partners this year, um, have um, uh, linked in with a company from Quebec who does hydroponic uh, disease ratings for phytophthora field tolerance. Um, we're just working on, uh, we can do this from seed, 
send the, we send them the seed. They do a replicated uh, trial. They give each variety a, a rating score, um, a, a score from one to five. Um, this is the first year that we've kind of done this. Uh, it won't be available for publication yet this year, but uh, the ultimate goal for this is to give farmers another tool. Uh, the reason that, that field trial is important because uh, I guess initially you don't know whether or not what, what the resistant pathotypes you have in, or in, your, in your soil or what pathotypes you have in your soil. So sometimes major genes doesn't always give you the benefit that you think it might. But knowing what field tolerance has, um, uh, um, what your field tolerance is, of that way you'll be able to pick a variety uh, that maybe has a little bit better field tolerance and uh, there's uh, be able to get more uh, bang for your buck, if you want to call it that, from just, than just the uh, major resistance. So uh, just something to keep in mind, something that's uh, to watch out for in, over the winter months here. Um, and uh, we'll kind of go forward from there. Um, the one thing I kind of want to follow up now, I'm going to just put a disclaimer on this. I am not the weed specialist. Um, so any questions you can direct to Kim Brown Livingston on, on, on the specifics of water hemp. Um, but I was fortunate for my part to, to be able to go along with, with Kim and a few others to look at some fields that had water hemp this year. And the reason I bring this up is this is going to become more and more of a problem every year. Uh, this is uh, from a field uh, in the Lac de Bonny area, and um, you can see how big this plant is. Uh, it was in a soybean field. Um, the interesting part about this is you could see there was a strip through the field, and it was almost like there was some contamination with equipment, and it was the only part of the field that they had um, a visual water hip. Um, if you're out thrashing soybeans right now and you see one of these big and wonderful plants in the field, you need to pull it up, you need to dig it up by the roots, you need to bag it, and you need to remove it from the field. And you need to do it as soon as you see it. You can't run it through the combine. Um, you will spread that seed all over the place if you run it through your combine. So that is something that, that, that I just want to bring forward to all the soybean growers. To tell you how bad this was, I'm going to go to my next slide here. This is the back of his pickup truck. And you can see how many, what, how many plants he pulled. This is one of four or five truckloads they pulled off the field. Um, again, seed spread is, is really bad. So you really need to uh, be aware of what you're seeing out in the field. So, and you know, if you're doing dry beans and you see the same thing, pull those plants. I think it's just something we need to really, can, we really need to talk about and, and really monitor um, because you may think it's just a pigweed, but it may be something else, especially if it's uh, you know, six to seven feet tall and towering above everything else. Um, so those are the major things I kind of wanted to touch on on this uh, presentation here. But if you do have any further questions, you can reach out to me and here's my contact information. And I turn back over to Lionel uh, for that. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Dennis. And uh, Laurie, if you could pass the screen back to me. Okay, um, we jumped around a little bit here, but I think uh, uh, Kim Brown uh, Livingston, our weed specialist, uh, is not going to be able to be with us today, but she did supply me with some information. So I'm going to go through uh, it for for everybody. Um, David already, or sorry, Dennis already talked about the uh, water hemp, and that's the picture there. So we've been seeing a lot of that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, Kim wanted to give, uh, she talked a little bit about uh, the seeding and uh, the seeding window and the narrow windows of spraying this year, which made weed control harder. And so I think we've talked about that a little bit already, but some good information she supplied me with is uh, we have some preliminary information on the weed survey. Uh, the three top weeds right now for the year, looks like they're gonna be uh, green foxtail, wild buckwheat and volunteer canola. Uh, other weeds that were fairly uh, predominant in fields were lambs, quarters, redroot pigweed, wild oats, Canada thistle, and smartweed. Um, foxtail barley uh, had the largest increase uh, and actually made the top 20 this year. Uh, and the other two weeds that made the top 20 that w haven't been in there before are golden dock and green pigweed. Um, Uh, yellow fox, delcosia, and uh, biennial wormwood 
uh, ranked higher uh, than they have in the past. Uh, and um, and again, uh, the water hemp is uh, is an issue, and it's being found in URMs and in places where you wouldn't even expect. And uh, uh, just a side comment, we did find it in in some of the areas uh, uh, not far from uh, the Russell. Uh, um, kind of the RM of uh, uh, Prairie View, so it's uh, it's moving or it has spread quite uh, quite a bit throughout the province. So another, like Dennis had mentioned, a weed to uh, keep on top of. Okay, uh, in the essence of time, I'm going to uh, put up this slide, and Timmy Oje, our weather guy, is on. And Timmy, uh, I seen this, our producer sent me this this morning and I sent it to you. Uh, it's, uh, I'll maybe let you explain it as uh, you kind of know best as how uh, these things work. Yeah, thank you very much, Lino. And um, just quickly, yeah, I think we are having a bit of a warmer weather over the next few days, but that's gonna be quickly followed by um, quite a low pressure system that'll be bringing in so um, I would say every precipitation between Monday and Wednesday. So um, depending on the model you're looking at, most of the models are agreeing that we would have, at least in the Red River Valley, anything between two to three inches is what it's been called for. Um, it would start as rain on Monday and uh, Monday night into Tuesday would likely evolve into wet snow. But when it's all said and done, by Wednesday evening, we should be having, I'd say, about two inches to three inches, depending on where you are, in the Red River Valley. Um, slightly lower amount um, to the southwest, so Brandon and west of Brandon would likely have an inch to two inches. But um, all, all said, I'd say, between Monday and Wednesday, we should have quite a significant amount of precipitation occurring. Um, for, for the longer term, for this fall, though, Environment Canada is calling for about 60 to 70 percent probability that the agricultural region of Manitoba will be warmer than normal. So that's quite significant um, that between October to December we would likely be warmer than normal. Now that doesn't mean we won't have the deep freeze occasionally but I would say for the next three months at least we would expect that will be slightly warmer than normal. In terms of precipitation there is equal probability of being below above or at normal precipitation and um, yeah, so that's pretty much the brief update I have. Great, thanks, Timmy. I kind of sprung that on you fairly quick this morning, so thanks for uh, uh, checking into it and uh, and, uh, and for coming on and giving us that uh, that update. Thanks, Timmy. Well, uh, just a few slides to uh, end off today. Uh, the Manitoba hay listing uh, is uh, still up and running, and if you've got hay for sale or looking to buy hay. Uh, definitely jump there. The crop residue burning authorization is on, so if you're looking at burning, uh, check to see, make sure we're in burning days. Uh, the On November the 2nd, there's a, uh, uh, I'm going to call it a livestock feeding day at the MBFI just north of Brandon, so if you're interested in attending, uh, there's the information there. Uh, Bunch of uh, I shouldn't say bunches. A few of uh, the Manitoba staff or ag staff are going to be going around uh, helping with producers uh, uh, with computer skill workshops, and they're going to be starting here shortly. And the first ones I think are November the 8th. So if you're interested, uh, there's the dates and locations. And uh, as you can see, there's lots of locations. So uh, there'll be one near you if you uh, want to get some updating on computer skills because a lot of the stuff is going to online and just like that, uh, the environmental farm plan is now online. So if you need to update it or you want to take your environmental farm plan, uh, go to the website and uh, type in environmental farm plan and it'll take you right to the, to the online, uh, online uh, application and course. Uh, there, uh, the uh, cleaning up or picking up of uh, unwanted pesticides and livestock uh, medications. If you're interested or you have stuff you want to get rid of, uh, there's the locations. Uh, we're kind of uh, right in the middle of it right now or just going to get just nicely getting started. So, uh, you know, make sure you uh, clean up your sheds and your barns and get rid of stuff that's been hanging around uh, for years. I want to put this one up about safe work. Um, there's been a couple of accidents lately and uh, 
just to be careful out there. I updated our crop production extension specialists uh, uh, page. Uh, we got uh, Calum and Veronica, their contact information and uh, a picture of, uh, of what they look like. So if you're uh, interested or you need help in any uh, uh, anything you're doing on the farm, uh, please contact any one of the crop production extension specialists and uh, they can give you a hand. Our livestock extension specialists, uh, there's their contact information. And if you're going to be attending the, uh, the day at the MBFI, you'll probably get an opportunity to meet them there. And uh, they'll have some real good information for you. And they, if you're doing uh, getting feed analysis done and wanting to do a forage ration, uh, these are the people to contact. Our ag services centers, uh, we're going to be doing our our uh, uh, harvest production reports uh, so we'll be needing to get information in so uh, definitely make sure you uh, have these numbers handy in case you need some help filling those out and questions uh, there's mine and Lori's contact information I'd like to thank everybody for attending I'd like to thank the panel for going through and spending the time getting those uh, that good information we had today uh, and uh, join us next week, uh, October the 26th for, uh, for Crop Talk. Thanks again.